Okay. Uh, now it's it works. So welcome everybody to the LISP session, working group meeting. Uh, we have a one hour meeting today. The usual note well, which you are supposed to have read it uh, during uh, your uh, registration procedure. I know you are familiar with every single line of this note well. Uh, a few tips for if you are in the room, you join the Mitico with the local uh, uh, tool, okay? Uh, so that in this way you can sign the blue sheets also, okay? Ri you can raise your hand if you want to go to the mic, uh, okay? And uh, wear a mask unless you, uh, you are at the mic and you are speaking, sometimes it's better that way. Otherwise for people that are in remote, the usual procedure with Mythic in, in remote, okay? This is a, a slide that we have already the last time. I think it's important, the code of, of conduct though, so uh, uh, I keep it. Uh, uh, we are expected to, to treat each other with courtesy, which means also to, to wear a mask because it's protecting each other, okay? We have technical discussions here, not personal discussions, okay? The, the 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 goal is to advance technically the internet and nothing else okay be ready to contribute so usual uh, links so i'm luigi here beside me is joel we are the co-chairs padma i don't know if she's online she's not no. Yeah, if somebody can help with the minutes, that would be very helpful. You have even the link. Um, oh. If you go to the agenda, uh, the main agenda, you have directly the link that brings you to the um, Etherpad, the equivalent of it. Just tell it you want to edit it, it'll ask you to re-log in, but once it's done that, you can just edit it. And anybody else can help you, but please appreciate if somebody's taking points on it. Yeah. Good. So if you, if you, if you start from the agenda page, right, show notepad for note takers, that's the link you want. And then you have to click on the pencil icon to switch from just viewing it to being in edit mode. Then it'll ask you to log in again. Then just tell it yes and you'll be fine. Thank you. You set? Okay. Um, a quick update on the status. So. Um, we are progressing in the last uh, two months that there, there was quite some some work to do we have eight documents now in the rfc editor queue which is good news so the these documents basically are through lispsec okay that uh, was quite, quite some discussions uh, on, on that one but uh, yeah we we seem to 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 are ready to actually also unblock some old documents like the, the introduction document, which is stuck in the queue for, uh, I don't know how long uh, anymore. <laughs> but now with the, 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 the beast document going through, we should be good. Is there any uh, actual item left for, okay, for me? Do I need to do something for this step? Because these on the RFC, uh, F2 means that they're done? Uh, means you're almost done. What you've got, what you've got in front of you, is when they get to it, the RF RPC, the production center, will do their job. 
when they are done, they will send to you an email that says, Auth48, here's what we did to your document. Please review and approve. There is a list of questions. Please answer them. Do so promptly, please. I've had authors in other contexts that, that they are work by the editors, but they, they, they have occasionally noticed, wait, you said X here and Y there. What did you mean? So it's mostly editorial, but they're very sharp and they, they occasionally spot other things. That's why answer the questions is important. And God, we've spent long enough on this. Luigi has done more work. I mean, my thanks to Luigi. He's done a tremendous amount of work. Uh, so the, uh, the ask is authors, when we hit Auth48, please be responsive. And it looks like the AD wants to chime in to add to that. You gotta find the on switch. It's up on the side of the microphone. And you gotta slide it all the way up. We want that, we gotta fix that. That's, we need that working. Here. Hand me that mic while you use this mic. It's so hard to say something. Uh, no, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, the documents. Um, keep in mind that um, we requested expedited processing for the whole cluster um, because of the request of um, ICAO, right? And there was no way to request processing for just two, so for the whole cluster, all seven or eight documents. So what that means is that please, as, as Joel said, Reply to the auth 48, ideally in 48 hours. I think that's what that's supposed to mean. Uh, so that we can get these documents out. Because all of them are probably going to come out together in, in one block. And so we need them to, to get out so we can uh, meet what uh, ICAO wants us to do. Yeah, remember we took it away from Noel. You took it away from Noel. Okay, yeah. 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 I mean, we may need to give the to tell the RPC don't worry about certain authors who okay. drifted away, but we'll we can deal with that. Yeah, let me know. I can override. Yeah. This is the that we are actually seeing the end of this mode of work. <laughs> oh, we are almost done. <laughs> Don't celebrate until it's published. Okay. Because you'll actually get the RP, you'll actually know what the RFP number is before it's published. Yeah, that's right. Because you'll see it in, our, in, in right. the off 48. Yeah, right. It's not done until it's okay. done. Okay. <laughs> Celebrate and love it. <laughs> yes, good plan. Uh, we have another couple of documents that they, they passed the working group last call. Um, we're working on that. Okay, the, there is the young model. I think it was. Uh, already mentioned in the last time, we, we, we should pay attention to that and moving it forward, I think is ready or, or really close to it, okay? And then we have a bunch of documents for which um, we need to, to, to focus on them now that the these documents are over, or almost over, okay? That's the next, next uh, task, I would say. Uh, the agenda for today, we have first uh, the LISP reliable transport. Okay, Mark uh, will, will present that. And then we have Dino with the satellite networks and distinguished name encoding. Unless there is any comment on the agenda, 
I guess we can move over. Okay, so Mark. Should I run the slides for you? Yes, I think. Yeah. Okay, so um, we just wanted to provide an update on the reliable transport drafts now that it's a working group document. <clears throat> um, I'm Mark, I'm presenting on behalf of a list of authors. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of updates, what we've done is, uh, yeah, we've been integrating all the changes that we've been discussing during the last meetings in this document. In particular, what we are doing, what we've done is, is provide further details on how do we do the transition from UDP to, to reliable transport. Then also the draft now incorporates the reliable transport bit um, that drives you know, the understanding between the ETR and the map server that when, when to use the reliable transport. Uh, now the document includes Quick as an alternative protocol to, to use. Uh, uh, for reliable transport and discusses a, a little bit how to select a protocol when you have multiple options. And I reserve the last part of the, the last slide that you'll see uh, for port allocations, uh, all the discussion that we had in the mailing list. Uh, you'll see. Uh, next slide, please. So from UDP to reliable transport, uh, the, the idea of that the draft defense, it's always, you must always first register with U, least UDP. Uh, once a successful UDP registration has happened, uh, that's the only time that you can switch to reliable transport. Um, so what we've done in the draft is clarify how this works, right? Um, in particular, and uh, there, there is this concept of as a security measure, the, the map server should never accept any reliable transport session. It should not even open the possibility until at least one ETR has registered with UDP and has expressed the intent to switch to reliable transport. Once an ETR expresses the intent to switch to reliable transport, that's, that's the time when the map server will put uh, this ETR R log in, in a in an acceptance list, and that's what the only time that, uh, from that moment on, it will start accepting connections from, from the CTR. And the other thing that the draft specifies is whenever the session goes down, uh, an ETR should always switch back to UDP uh, before attempting reliable transport again. Uh, next slide. The second thing that the draft documents is the... Oh. Uh, about um, future weight technology, speaking as me. So there's no graceful restart? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the idea was um, to keep things a bit simpler, uh, uh, just to always go back no? to uh, okay. it, whenever possible. So right? just, yeah. just mm -hmm. because, I mean, you're already authenticated. Uh -huh. And, um, well, I don't know. Uh, no, 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 I'll, I'll go read the point, draft yeah, yeah. a little bit better and, and yeah. ask later. Yeah. No, no, it's a good point. Um, the draft now doesn't consider it, but um, yeah, it's a good idea to tonight. The problem is that you, you don't know um, whether you have lost the state uh, when, when, whenever there is a problem with a reliable transport. Uh, so the, the simpler way that we found was to just go back, right, and restart from scratch. Just real quick, this is Dino. Yeah. I didn't understand the question, so I don't know what you're answering. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the question was, um, he said that if the TCP session goes down, then you have to go back and authenticate again via UDP. Well, you're constantly sending that registry. Yeah. And the, the authentication data is contained in that registry. So it's a periodic re-authentication, it's not a session, but it's Maybe at the mic. Okay, so, um, okay. Yeah, right. makes sense. Yeah. So if, if you just, on the mailing list, if you could just say what, what you mean, what are you thinking about 
graceful restart that we'll understand specifically what you're talking about. Okay, so the other thing that, the, that I've now incorporated is the reliable transport bit. Uh, this bit is it's just used um, so that the ETR doesn't need, doesn't need to guess whether a map server can accept uh, a reliable transport establishment or not. So the, the idea is in the map register, we set this bit uh, whenever an ETR, uh, so that the ETR can express intent to establish a reliable transport. Uh, next slide. And then the map, the map server in the map notify can set the corresponding bit just to uh, tell back the ETR, OK, now you can go ahead and, and try to establish a reliable transport with me. Uh, next slide. OK, so what the working group document now incorporates is the list of protocols that can be used to establish the reliable transport. And as part of this list, now we incorporate quick. To, to the list, uh, as we discussed in the mailing list. Um, one important thing that we've incorporated, and it would be good if we can have a discussion on this, but um, first thing is that for all protocols, what the draft specifies is that all the sessions will be long lived, right? So once the session established, this is what, uh, there is this understanding that the state is synchronized between the ETR and, and, and the map server, and this is what simplifies some processes with reliable transport. But the second part is the one that I'm interested, or we are interested in, in hearing back is, as of now, the draft specifies that Quick and SCTP will use a single stream, right? We know that the protocol uh, offers the possibility to, to, to establish multiple streams between the ETR and the map server. But since we are using this for a very specific interface and very specific messages between ETR and map server, uh, for now the, the draft just reduces do this to the single stream. Um, if you guys have different experience and, and, and you think we, we should upgrade to, to specify multiple streams, we can always do that. Um, OK, uh, next slide. <clears throat> OK, this, uh, this part of the draft uh, answers, uh, Dino had a comment on, on, OK, now since we have multiple protocols, uh, how do we choose among them? And, and what do we do about the potential delay that can come from the fact that, OK, I'm trying one protocol. Maybe this protocol fails. Uh, next protocol comes, right? So the draft now specifies an order, but just as a suggestion, let's say, uh, with a may. Um, so if the ETR can support the three protocols, this would be the suggested order. But also, we also introduced this node saying, OK, um, since we don't want um, the information, the mapping information to be delayed while we try to establish the reliable transport, the ETR should always make sure that it's sending complete mapping information in, with UDP uh, while waiting for, for the reliable transport to, to be established. Please. Okay. Um, first an observation. I mean, if we need a reliable transport, I would choose at least one as mandatory to be implemented with this draft. I mean, otherwise, I mean, just choose one. Okay. My suggestion is, is TCP. This yeah. one makes sense. It's, it's the uh, one that we have for now. Right? It. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, about the order, uh, you, you can suggest an order. I don't think there is the need to to mandate an okay. order in any way because anyway the, the choice is limited. So. Okay. But, uh, okay. Yeah. No, no, that's a good point. Um, okay. Yeah, we can make TCP mandatory. <clears throat> Um, good. Yeah. And next one, please. Yeah, this is the last one, and this is what we discussed in the mailing list. Uh, what happens with the ports now that we have multiple transports? Um, for TCB, it's easy. We can reuse for 342. Um, one comment that we have is that uh, the list cons drafts expired. So officially, in the IANA page, uh, for 342 is not reserved anymore. 
Um, then for Quig and SCTV, we will need to request new ports. Um, just, just one minor note, uh, since we added the IANA considerations uh, in the draft, we got this mail automated, I guess, from IANA, uh, specifying a procedure to, to request these ports. And they also say that uh, the closer we get to last call, then it's when, when they will act on it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I would like to hear, uh, based on past experience, no? if you think we need to do anything else than, than this section. So I understand, I mean, this is Dino. Um, I understand that we need a new UDP port for quick, but I thought, maybe you might know, Alvaro, SCTP uses the same port number data points as TCP and UDP. So ah. we need an explicit, I, I don't know what an SCTP port is, it's just, a port, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I actually went through the SCTP draft and I saw that they even have a section specifying how, how to request a new port. I mean, maybe we can map it to 4342 also, but, but as far as I understood, they, they have their own registry. Uh, they have their own registry of yeah. ports? Okay. As far as I understood, right? Uh, yeah, if we know different. Yeah. But I'm lazy to go there, but uh, yeah, no, <laughs> go just to make a go. Uh, yeah, maybe it's just a matter to find a good registry. Maybe we can reuse 43, 42, or even for other protocols. Course, it's yeah. just the, the least port, let's say, and then uh, you have different protocols that are uh, supported. You don't need to have different port numbers. Port is, port, yeah. yeah, the only one, based on what we discussed, I think, for quick, we need the one, right? So, so, so that we the map server knows that it's it's not, let's say, legacy list UDP, but needs uh, yeah, to it to, quick may yeah. be more trickier. Yeah, right? but but uh, at yeah, least for uh, ACTP, I, I think for TC forty two should work. Okay, if Perfect. it's not taken, I mean. Yeah, uh, right. yeah, I can check it out. Just oh. make it simple. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, and that was the last slide. <clears throat> Any further comments or question? What? No. Thank you. Thanks. So Dino. Do you mind if we do the distinguished names first? Okay. You can have raised this uh, I think the be, agenda. I think it'll be. Okay. No problem. Um, I just think it'll be quicker. We are flexible. <laughs> We have nice chairs, you see. Very nice chairs. They're very nice chairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to give an update on the Dash 15 version of uh, name encoding. Next slide. Okay, just to give you an overview of what it is, um, we can encode um, what we call distinguished names or just character strings that can be put in an EID record or an Arlo record of any of the list messages. Um, we use uh, the AFI encoding like we do for AFI 1 and 2 for IPv4 and IPv6. So it's, uh, it's just basically a two-byte AFI 17 value followed by an ASCII string that's null terminated. It's pretty straightforward. And it's useful to provide self-documenting the mapping database records. Um, you could also use it to group a bunch of things together. So um, Maybe you want to associate all EIDs on a train with the name of the train. So you would have, you would register to the mapping system a name called train 154, and then you would have a list of EIDs that are currently in the train. It might have some mobility benefits there. Uh, there's a lot of other um, sorts of things you could do as well. The idea here is that we don't want to break the semantics of this string with power of two in addresses. So. DDT and Lisp Decent, those two mapping database systems could support this. So for instance, um, if you did a lookup on slash root slash Dino slash slide slash Philly, it could match slash root slash Dino at the DDT root, which would be the delegation authority for that part of the name. And then the children could then support slash slides or slash slides Philly. So it looks like it's more specific, just like it would be with a power of two um, address. So rather than, it wouldn't have bit boundaries, it could have arbitrary boundaries just based on, um, so, so the, the designer of the mapping system would have to decide if the slashes were the boundaries because they could be variable length. Um, 
So map, re map request lookups typically in the use cases that I've implemented and that are currently written in specs do exact match, but you could also um, do partial matches as well. Like if I looked up um, slash root slash Dino slash slice slash Philly and slash Philly wasn't registered, but slash root slash Dino was, you could get that return. And that would just be a natural thing that the map server would do with no changes. Next slide. This is an example of what I implemented in my open source code is uh, this is a, a registration entry in the map server, the EID prefix in um, instance ID one is called g-xtr1. This is just an XTR that's sitting in Google in a VM. And the rloc, the rloc set um, is basically um, these guys. The rloc set basically has these two RTRs because it's going through a NAT. But you could also associate a name with, the, with an rloc record. So it's encoded in that rloc record. This is an encoding in the EID record. This is the encoding in the rloc record. These are the current um, working group and individual submission uh, drafts that are using the distinguished name stuff. So the ED ECDSA authentication is using it to store um, the hash value when you want to look public keys up in the mapping system to verify signatures. Uh, we use it for grouping type stuff in predictive RLOCs. And uh, we use it for encoding. Uh, if, you, if you use the LCAF geo coordinates, as an EID and you wanna map it to a name, like say you have the geo coordinates of Los Angeles, you may want it to map to a name, which is called character string Los Angeles, you could do that sort of thing. The list policy distribution guys are using, there's a lot of policy stuff that they wanna use that are gonna depend on, um, on distinguished names. And in all these cases, they're describing um, how the structure of the name should be and what the collision opportunities or, or avoidance is done in those. That was a comment that was done on, uh, on the spec. Uberlay, simple NAT, and the list didn't cast up refers to this draft. Okay. So we started the effort. The draft was built in 2016. There was a lot of quiet period. Uh, around here in 2020, there were some updates. And we just made an update now this past week to reflect, make it more clear how collision detection is done if there's two different use cases using names and how they don't clash. So we put, added that to the spec and that was Joel's comment and uh, we think we satisfied the comment, right? You did. Okay, next. Um, so we addressed the collision commentary um, that Joel had in slash 15 and I requested this past weekend to request this as a working group document. I sent that request to lisp at ietf.org and it's really, a, it's a very small two page um, spec, so it doesn't take very much to read through it. So I wanted to try to request working group last call now, but um, it's up to you guys. You really should request adoption, go through adoption, <laughs> and then turn around and request. You don't even have to repost it. We can mark it as adopted using the exact same draft, and then we can turn around and last call it. And in last call, that's when we switch it to a IETF dash list from Fahrenheit. Well, we, we no. can never, we can not even switch it if you don't want to. Oh, it doesn't matter to me. The point I, is, I don't think I'm the bottleneck. I want to, I want to get go through the adoption call so folks have the chance to comment on it in the proper process, okay. and then we'll do the last call. So that's Look, two, we can two, two we weeks. Go through right? all of that before London. Okay, sounds good. Uh, hi, Alberto Tanarani. I'm happy with the process. Please rename it before sending it to the AEG. So uh, we've had people complain about the names before, and so just to avoid okay, complaints. Wrong, but okay, we'll make sure it gets the <laughs> just, you know. So you wait two weeks and to see if it should we be issued. We issued the adoption call. You send a note to the list. I, I think you did. did that. We, we can issue. We will issue the adoption call next week. Okay. We give everybody the amount of time. It'll be two weeks. Actually, yeah. we may make it three weeks because it's August. We'll then say it's adopted. Please repost with the right name. You'll repost. Okay. You'll then send an email saying, can we last call this? So okay. We'll last call it two weeks. If there's a problem, we'll fix it. And if not, 
We'll uh, hand it to Alvaro and we'll pick somebody in the working group to shepherd him. Maybe ask for a review. Uh, Joel did it already, but uh, <laughs> okay. addition. In the mean, in the meantime, I mean, when it is adopted, uh, we can also ask for um, early review from the security area or and other areas, transport area, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so that we we we, the, we speed up the process a little bit. Right, so asking for early reviews doesn't speed up the process. Uh, you have to edit at some point. So, yeah, no, but they, and they will still insist not, on doing it as part but, of and, the, and they will yeah, also yeah. ask what our intention of the spec is. Is it full standard, proposed standard, experimental, all that? And I don't know if we're ready yeah, because those other drafts depend on it. It can only go yeah. PS. Yeah, okay. It can only go PS. PS okay. So okay. No That's fine. But we, there's no point in worrying about early reviews. There's just not going to be enough weeks in here to waste any other energy. Okay. We'll just make it go through the process expeditiously. Got it. Uh, Sharon is on the queue. Uh, wait, there, there was Sharon. Um, Sharon, want to ask something? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think this is, of course, a, a great idea and a, a way for people to understand how to solve uh, problems using a routed namespace, which a Lisp is uniquely qualified to do. But it's hard to explain um, that use of Lisp without being able to discuss use cases as part of the charter. So uh, at least select uh, use cases, uh, a, a possibility to discuss should be added to the charter for us to really show the power of, uh, of this uh, route and namespace. Go, go back to the slide with the yellow stuff on it. One more. So all these drafts that depend on distinguished names are in the charter to, to solve problems that are in the charter. Does anybody disagree with that? I mean, well, I mean, some of the individual submissions like Lisp Simple NAT is just an informational type RFC of talking about my implementation of NAT and Uberlays is still in design. So I don't, I don't know if those are in the charter, but. I think you, you're missing VPNs also, right? In this list. Does, the least VPN, VPN draft. Does, does VPNs use? Uh, I think the extranet section has some. Uh, oh, because yeah, I looked names. at that draft and I didn't see any reference to distinguished names. So that's the question. Oh, okay. So if it does use it, we need to put a reference in there. Okay. But that, okay, well, case in point, you made a great point because VPN is a very important draft yeah. because it's instant ID, which everything uses. Yeah. Is that okay, Sharon? Did we answer your question or concern? Is that uh, we should add use cases to the charter? Yeah, that's another Char question. <laughs> yeah, that's a different question in the sense that uh, to, to change the charter, we have to recharter, which is not uh, uh, how to say. Uh, I mean, the, the charter right now has a, a strong focus basically on the BIS documents, so that, that, that to, to work on the proposed standard version of LISP, which we almost done. Once uh, we are really done with that, we can even open the discussion for our chartering to refocus the work of the, uh, of the working group, uh, I, I guess. So this is something that we, we, we can discuss, but not today, let's say. So I don't know not if... Today. <laughs> um, I'm not going to suggest we discuss it today, but what I'm going to say is that um, if everything goes to plan, we should, within a month, publish the, the revised specs, right? So within a month, if there's a charter, you know, we can start the process, right? The formal process of, of approving the charter and the IESG and you know, all that stuff. Uh, disturb the process, you said? Start. Start. Okay. Yes. So, in other words, you don't have to decide on a charter today, yeah. but you, know, you don't have to wait till London or anything like that. We can probably recharter between now and London. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Assuming that there's you know, time for you guys to discuss it. Okay. Any other question or comment of, on this one, Albert? Uh, yeah, I have two questions, actually. I'm just reading the draft right now. Um, you're not specifying how to use this. Uh, 
So what we recommended is that each of the use case documents that you say that you see here on the screen is saying how to use it. Okay, so that I'm going to find that here somewhere. Okay, and the other thing is uh, this uses ASCII, not UTF-8 or something like that uh, for make, nationalization stuff. I made a reference in there of the actual encoding. Um, yeah, it says ASCII. But it's, it, is the reference to say ASCII? Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, what they wanted. We discussed it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's a question that's definitely going to come up at some point. Why not use international UTF? Because, you know. The internationalization part of it, why not? Is that what you mean? Right, right. Exactly. Okay. I mean, I don't have, I don't have an opinion either way, and we could add it at this point, but do you guys that depend on the use cases care? Because we have to, we can maybe you want to put names in kanji or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah for now, no. It's, yeah, yeah. We've been, ASCII has been enough, but, but yeah, also no, okay. no opinion either way. No. So, so I'll, I'll make that update. Is it, UTF-8 is what you're... You right, and you know, so uh, in other places like BGP that we've been putting strings, uh -huh. uh, they've been in UTF-8, and we actually ran into a problem with one community thing where the space wasn't enough. Because, for example, in Cyrillic, no. you need a lot more characters or something like I'm that. I'm sorry. No, there's a, no, it turns out there's a big problem. We can't just go to UTF-8. Okay. If we want to go to UTF-8, we would have to redo the, the structure completely because right. you rely on zero termination. Yes. Zero termination does not work for UTF-8. So it's either we leave it the way it is or we redo it completely. You can't just go to UTF-8. It sounds like to me we should keep it the way it is. And if we need other types of character sets, we build an LCAF. And then it's a more flexible. What do okay, you think? Just, just be ready for the question, right? Because someone else can ask. Yeah. That, no, it's a question. And will they, get will they accept our answer that we want to keep it in ASCII? <laughs> but can, can we put it? Can we put it explicitly on the draft as a statement that says for the use cases yeah, uh, discussed, uh, the, word, the, 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 the ASCII encoding looks sufficient? Does it make sense or not? I think I don't it, know. Says, it says what it says. Right. Um, but the question will come up, and whoever's shepherding it will have to be prepared to deal with it. OK. <laughs> Sounds like you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's, no, we'll it's probably get somebody else to do it. We should be getting other people to oh, shepherd. Oh, okay, shepherd okay. It. Okay. Whatever. Luigi shepherded all those hard ones. Yeah, he needs a break. <laughs> <laughs> Some addition. It's all good. Any more questions or comments on this one? Okay, let's move to the next satellite. So this draft um, is a first stab at looking at using the satellite networks um, as an underlay and running LISP as an overlay on top of that. So it's kind of got to stand on your head a little bit, but I'll show you in a diagram in a second. So the high level goals for this draft is, uh, we know that a LISP overlay can run over any IP packet delivery underlay, be it IPv4 or IPv6. And if the satellite net network can deliver IP packets, which existing, the, the, the satellite networks that I know that are in operation today can do that, uh, we can have LISP run as an overlay on top of that satellite network. Um, with, with actually, without touching anything in the satellite network. And this would be just another example of how we can run LISP um, over, like we do the capital I internet, where the R locs are on the ground, or 3GPP network, where we run LISP on the E-Node Bs, or in the ICO network, the aeronautical network, where we run LISP on the ground stations. We would just run LISP on the ground stations here that have satellite links up. Next. Um, this is not necessarily how it works, but kind of what are the benefits. But as always, any LISP underlay or any underlay network doesn't store EID state. So that would be the same with the satellite network. The satellite network is unaware that LISP is running over it. It's just, just like it's kind of unaware of any other applications that run over it too. 
So it's not, it, it's actually ignoring the satellite network and just using it as, a, as an IP delivery system. The overlay requires the uh, underlay to deliver packets to our look addresses and the underlay, uh, can, that the underlay can route to. So the assumption is, is when um, an ITR prepends a packet and uses the outer destination address, we assume that the underlay could um, forward that packet and that's what we call a routing locator or our look. The underlay network can transport IPv4, IPv6 packets and can be dual stack just like it can on the terrestrial network, okay. And when path optimization is available in the underlay, just like on the capital I internet now, if you're running segment routing and you want the XTR to influence the path of the underlay, it could prepend source routes or segment routes in the packet. This would be the same in the satellite network as well if we wanted to use any kind of source routing, be it relative to the satellite network or using um, ITF mechanisms. Next. So here's a pictorial. Uh, we see those satellites up in space. We call that the underlay. And we see those links between satellites called um, ISLs, intersatellite links. Those are typically one or more laser links that go between um, the satellites in low Earth orbit in LEO. Uh, and it turns out that this is what um, Amazon is about to, to deploy as well as uh, um, SpaceX doing with Starlink, okay? So what we do is that these what we have on the ground are the overlaid nodes and the mapping system, okay? So LISP, an XTR will run on the ground station that has a satellite link that goes up. Today, most communications that happen is you go up in one satellite and then down. If you go, if you can go like a quarter of the earth, you can do it with one satellite um, because of where the, uh, the um, satellites are positioned in LEO. In geosynchronous, that was always the way because it was much higher up added delay, but it can capture more of the Earth's surface. Here, it may not do that. So if you want to go from, say, like San Francisco to London, you might have to go up a satellite, an ISL to another satellite, and then down, OK? But the idea is, is that LISP doesn't care about this. Whatever the satellite has to do to deliver a packet from this r -look to that r -look, it just does that, OK? Next slide. So these are the sort of features. Sorry for the busyness of the slide, but we'll go through one each. The EIDs can roam around ground station XTRs, just like the mobility draft, the ID mobility draft says. It's no different than if the EIDs are roaming in a VM on a top of rack switch. It's the same sort of machinery that's used. So EID mobility and even predictive r -locs can be used even in this scenario because uh, it's, these are list features and we don't care what, we don't depend on the underlay to do anything here. Also, the ground station XDRs can load split traffic across different r -locs on the satellite network or across r -locs where an r -loc could be up in space and one could be terrestrial on the ground as well. And of course, all the packets can be list cryptoed as well. So if they go up to space and you don't want anybody to snoop on them, even though the Russians are leaving the space center now, um, you could, um, you could encrypt the packets. And of course, the GSXDRs can use alternate paths when maybe the satellite le network is not totally connected. And I give two examples here. Normally, you would go on an XTR, you would go up to a satellite and then maybe go across an ISL to another satellite and then down to another XTR. Maybe the ISLs are, because the satellites are always moving, the lasers are going up and down all the time. You may not have that connectivity. But of course, we can use list traffic engineering and actually encapsulate to an RTR. So we would go up from this XTR to a satellite and then back down to an RTR that would take off the outer header and re-encapsulate it to that r -look and then go up to a satellite and down. So those, those sort of traffic engineering features are available by just using regular LISP. Okay. Um, and we could use the telemetry stuff that we proposed in that draft, this draft here, to actually test the satellite network so we know which paths are good. And we could, we could actually, if, if the satellite network, each satellite is an IP hop, we could actually trace route, we can measure one-way latency, both forward and reverse, hop counts, all that kind of stuff, just like we do the, under, the uh, terrestrial underlay. Boy, it's hard to breathe and present, present at the same time. <laughs> have, haven't done this yet. Um, Uh, ground stations XTRs can offer EID multicast service by doing head-end replication using any underlay multicast service. 
So if the satellite network is going to pr provide a multicast service, we can use it. Otherwise, you can just unicast replicate over it. We know that works as well. Uh, I'm not, it's not clear to me, and it hasn't been spec'd out, if there's a multicast service that's going to be supported in the, in the satellite networks that are being deployed today or are planning to be deployed. That should be interesting work. Like I said, this is kind of a first stab. We're learning more about what the underlay could do and are there advantages to make the overlay work better if we can make, um, take advantage of the underlay. It's kind of two-sided sword where you sometimes want to always ignore the underlay because you just want it to deliver simple packets and then you just want the, all the features to be on the edge in the overlay. And of course, if you have a mix of LISP and non-LISP sites, all the inner working features. So if you have, um, um, somebody on EID that's sitting behind a ground station XTR that wants to talk to google.com that's not a LISP site, all the machinery, the LISP, the LISP mat stuff and the um, PXTR machinery can work as well. Um, the only thing we didn't um, talk about is do you want to put any LISP nodes in on the satellite nodes and make them routers? Not sure yet, so if anybody has any thoughts of, on that and if it's useful, um, we, we could determine that. I don't know if, if there's any advantage other than maybe latency to do a decap up there rather than down here, you know. So. Next. Um, so I was just question, should we make it a working group document? I don't, I, don't, I don't have any preference. I mean, we could work on it as an individual um, submission. I think the work that we have left to do is to look closer at the satellite um, networks and see what's going on. And um, maybe try to do some prototyping. I think my open source implementation could work as is. I just need a, a box with a satellite link. So I'm gonna. I, my plans are is to call up SpaceX and say, "Can I put some open source code on, on your uh, ground station?" And let's see what they what they would do. What they would say. I don't know, but I'm gonna try. But you know, even if actually, even if it's one hop away from a Starlink box, it might serve the same purpose because the server could, you know what I mean? So we can, we can still test it. So the whole point is, is if we encapsulate a packet and the, the Starlink router is not doing list, but at least it knows how to route the packet to the R look and it will go up, right? So mm -hmm. now when it comes down, the way their service works now, when it comes down, it always comes to a Google data center. So um, you're not, you're, you'll have to deliver it to a, a non-EID or something like that. But we'll, you know, if we can put an XTR in a, in a VM in a, in a Google cloud or whatever, and test it that way. So I, I'm planning on doing some experiments with that. Any, you guys are welcome to help. Huh? Yeah, oh yeah. I think that's it. Is that right? Oh. Yeah. Let's have a question. Question and comments. Um, have you given any consideration to mobility in the draft? I haven't read it, sorry, but. Uh, um, so the, the devices that are on the ground that are moving from ground station to ground station, they'll use EID mobility according to the draft we did. So, so what what moves is not the XTR, it's it's the oh the uh, XTR moving. Well, this is an interesting new property that we've never seen before because even though the XTR is stationary, normally um, normally when a LISP, when EIDs move, they get new R logs because they're landing somewhere new, yeah. right? But it turns out what's happening is now the um, XTR is actually stationary, right? But the satellites are moving in and out. And the question is, will the satellite network re, um, reassign the R lobe yeah. to that ground station? But if it does, it's just like the EID moves. So it is kind of like a mobility event, but all our machinery will work with, in that case as well. So okay. kind of cool. Thank I you. think <laughs> we'll see. We'll yeah. see if it introduces new problems. <laughs> Thank you. But I, I've done this testing before where I would run LISP at my house and I would disconnect my cable link all the time. And every time I disconnect, well, I think it was a, it was a few years ago with AT&T DSL. Every time I disconnect and reconnected, AT&T would give me another address. So I was testing my hour looks changing all the time. Oh, okay. And I was trying to do that fast and, so you know, it's so. The same with okay. <laughs> so this is not a new problem from our, our the overlays point of view. Okay. Genji. Genji, uh, China Mobile. Um, you know, I haven't read through your, uh, your draft, but the, from your description and talk today, I, and also you said, okay, so far there are only one SL link, but multi uh, SL link things, you did not mention anything about the dynamics of how the rotation, orbital movement, those type of things. 
So I don't know why it's the satellite related. I think because I can give you an analogy, you can put your R lock on your car and you keep driving and then that's it. It's not satellite at all, but it's still. So why is satellite? It makes such a big deal for the truck. Thank you. Uh, oh, we're just, it's just another underlay that we can run over. And if, if we wanna reach rural places, um, which is what Starlink's use case is, uh, we may want to run. It's it's not the only way you can do things. I mean, if your R lock, if you're on a car, if you're driving in a car and Lisp is running in your car and your R lock is changing because it's on a 4G or 5G network, so be it. But if if that car needs to communicate with something that's in a you know up in Montana, northern Montana or something, and they don't have internet access except for Starlink, then you run Lisp on that side, and then and then they can move between ground stations in their local area. You know, the car's moving around in this urban area, and then maybe the cell phone's moving around in this rural area, you know. In terms of uh, technology, I, I still cannot see the, the technical difference. Like, yes, I understand, well, in order to talk to some people in Mahana, some, some place, nowhere, you have your satellite. But still, in terms of technology, it, to me, it's just like a, it's a moving car, is ha have no difference from just like a satellite movement. Are you saying, are you questioning that running over satellites not useful? Is no, that no, what no, 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 okay. because the, tomorrow I'm going to have another, I have a draft on the satellite, but I really try to understand why, you know, uh, this is satellite. So suppose you try to use some satellite technology that is significant for the list or for your draft. Is that the... No, I haven't read through. So in your draft, have you talked anything about like uh, satellite technologies that will make your draft the more significant? Or is it just like, okay, you are using some underlay network that is keep moving? We, we have a LISP draft called LISP Mobile Network. Mm -hmm. That talks about how you support layer three mobility inside a three GPP network. In that use case, we say LISP can run on the E-Node Bs. So when cell phones move, move from one E-Node B to another E-Node B, they don't have to change their IP address and their connections stay up, okay? So that's a case because cell phones connect to towers, okay? Now we have these other things called ground station XTRs that have RF links up to aircraft. That's what the AGCOW standard is doing. And so planes are moving around and, and um, their EIDs up there and they're, connecting to ground stations. And so that's just another sub-network using that wireless network. So now we have satellite, which is yet another one. And of course, we have the terrestrial internet, right? That's all. OK. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, Eric Klein. Oh, sorry, Eric Klein, Elyria. Um, forgive me for I'm not uh, a terribly well-versed LISP person. Uh, is there a presumption that the uh, GSXDRs have some terrestrial control plane connectivity all the time, or is it possible that they may only have control plane connectivity over the orbital domain? Yeah, good question. And, and if so, yeah. does that have implications for uh, the control plane uh, reliability? Yeah, great, really good question. Can you go back to the diagram? So the mapping system, the assumption we're making in the first version of the draft is that the mapping system is on the ground, and that's the control plane that we use to for this guy to find that guy's R load. But it turns out that the mapping system IP addresses to access it, the map servers and resolvers are all in R load space. So you arguably could put the mapping system somewhere there, assuming that the satellite can route to that R load space as well. So, and so you could do one or the other, or you could look, this mapping system could have map servers that are load split. So we don't, we don't know yet what's the best thing to do. But uh, I'm taking, the point that you're making that if we put it up in the satellite network that there will be less reliability because they're moving the mapping system is moving now where here it's kind of stationary well there's also yeah just, even if everything's working correctly there's just higher latencies right yeah good point so yep, you, yep. You, the, the tcp yeah. tcp stuff will need some kind of a pep in front of it and yeah, right anyway yeah definitely agree yeah thank you okay. uh, I have one, one last question. I, I mean, if you go to this slide, I left. Yeah, you say uh, across in the second bullet or across R locks in space. If in space you have R locks, it means that the satellites have to, 
for an Lisp, they have to be XDRs, right? Because oh. otherwise, it's just an underlay. Yeah. Uh, I'll show you what I mean. Uh, I understand your question. Okay. Uh, could you go to the uh, to the uh, diagram? Back here. Okay. Yeah. So let's say this XDR has our load that's always reachable via the satellite. This right. X, this XDR, this. That, that XTR on the right-hand side could have a terrestrial link that's also accessible to, on the ground. So there would be two R loads that you can load split your traffic over. Oh, okay. That's I what see. Uh, Okay, I see. So what point. you're doing is you're load splitting for different flows, this on the ground and going up and over. Okay, okay, okay. Well, this was not clear. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to make that more clear, mm -hmm. especially in the draft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go, Mike Cisco. Uh, hey, Mike. I was wondering if you, if you gave any consideration if there's any uh, MTU limitations between the GSXDR and the satellite. Because I know that mil like the US military and these guys, they have crypto devices in front. And they're always struggling to get like GRE and MTLS and this whole alphabet yeah. soup thing up there. Yeah, I don't so, know yet. That's a, right, great, okay. that's a great question and we should look at that. Of course, we always assume 1500 or, or, tw or 1266 for IPv6 or whatever. Right. You know, so. But yeah, that's a good point. And and if there are MTU issues, we'll deal with them like we do in 6831, where you know we have those three options. You know. Okay. So if there are no more questions or comments, uh, uh, there is Jordi. Well, just just this out of curiosity. Um, well, you know, the ISL, ISL links, they usually change between the satellites, as far as I know. Do you think it would make sense converting each satellite into a mobile node, at least mobile node? Or yeah, from a list perspective? Yeah. Like give it an EID and let it, uh, let's see. Yeah, so they can, so, I mean, the mobility use case, no? since you have a lot of uh, links that are changing continuously, the satellites. Uh... So I think what you're saying is a satellite could be a Linux system that's part of the overlay and we assign it an EID because we want to talk to it on the overlay. That, I mean, yeah. that's well, why I interpret your question. Not necessarily talk to it, no, but you have, uh, so you have satellites that are, the, the, the topology, the point of attachment is always changing, no? so they have R logs. Yeah, right. So I don't know, I so was just wondering. Wanna, so you want to track where, what R logs, well, it's not, I mean, these satellites can move around and they're probably not going to be IP, re-IP addressed. So their mm -hmm. looks are going to stay the same, but you're not going to be able to reach them because they're on the other side of the earth. Okay, yeah. So yeah it's, so, okay, so it's not the different IP address, the different uh, it's, place. It's, it's unreachable, place. right? Okay, okay, yeah. thanks. And then 40 minutes later, it's going to come around and you're going to see it again, right? But of course, this guy doesn't know because he's homing to a satellite and that satellite's come in and out. He just has connectivity. He doesn't even really care what he is. Remember the R loc that he's sending a packet to is on the ground, uh -huh. and the and the satellite is just a transit network. Yeah, no, but it yeah. was like a different use case that I was mm. considering. Yeah, I but I mean, I, I haven't considered what if you want a satellite system to be an EID node that's part of the overlay, and and because it will go out of phase, do you want to be able to reach it on the overlay? It's a little more complex use case, and we'd have to see a, a really strong requirement why we would need that. But mm -hmm. right now. I just want to use the satellite as it exists and see how well it delivers IP packets, right? This is something that we can discuss more on the mailing list. We are, uh, time is up basically. Kenji, if you can also send your comment on the mailing list sure, so sure. that can be discussed more and clarified, that would be helpful. Other than that, welcome. Uh, uh, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, Dino. And see you again uh, in London. Just, oh, well, you <laughs> no, no, but um, yeah.